Everyone, so first of all, thank you all for coming out. This is a huge turnout, um, and uh, our guest speaker deserves it. So um, just really briefly, you, you saw the flyer. We have Dr. Erica De Bruin, who is an assistant professor of government at Hamilton College and a non-resident fellow at the Modern War Institute here at West Point. Uh, she is one of the leading scholars on civil wars and coups right now. Uh, she's also, um, you know, for those of you thinking about doing research right now or graduate school at some point, uh, she developed um, one of the first, if not the first, data set on different kinds of security forces that states use that is um, really getting a lot of attention right now. Uh, personally, I've also known her since I was early in grad school, and I think she is one of the kindest and most generous scholars I know. Um, so I'm really happy to be able to to host her here and have this conversation about her really awesome research with you guys. And so thank you all for coming out. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. DeBruyne. All right, well, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. I am really excited to be here today uh, to talk to you guys about my new book. Uh, my book was published on Sunday, so this is you are the first audience that I'm talking to uh, about the finished product, and I'm really excited to uh, uh, talk to you about it. So I'm going to go ahead and I've prepared a couple slides to show you guys. I'm going to um, share those right now. All right. Can you see the, can everybody see these okay? Yeah? Yes. All right, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, the book that I'm gonna talk to you about today is called How to Prevent Coups d'etat, Counterbalancing and Regime Survival. And the reason why uh, I thought it worth writing a whole book about how to prevent coups is that military coups remain incredibly common across the globe. They're common in dictatorships and uh, in weakly institutionalized democracies. Between 2000 and 2019, there were more than 50 coup attempts in 31 countries around the globe. So coup attempts are not as common as they once were. The kind of heyday of coups abroad is um, was in the 1970s, uh, but they still remain very common. And the strategies that rulers use to try and prevent coups uh, have a whole series of sort of detrimental side effects. So they can undermine military effectiveness, which is a pretty crucial issue. Um, and some of the strategies also end up uh, in creating incentives for additional repression against um, uh, against citizens within a country. And so coups are very common um, and they can have the efforts that leaders take to prevent them can can be detrimental in a number of ways. Now, there's a couple different strategies that rulers might take to try and prevent military coups, to try and remain, uh, to keep the military under civilian control. One sort of distinction that's commonly made, this comes from Samuel Huntington, is this distinction between objective strategies of control and subjective strategies of control. So in objective control, the idea is that there's a clear division of labor or authority between military and civilian spheres. In this concept, the military is supposed to be isolated from politics and has autonomy in its own uh, area. So military leaders are supposed to decide when to use force, our civilian leaders are decide when to use force, and military leaders are the ones that plan and execute it. And there's this kind of mutual respect for these different spheres, and the military doesn't get involved because it's um, a subordinate to civilian authority more broadly. This is in contrast to subjective strategies of control, which try to subordinate the military to a particular ruler, particular political party, or some segment of the population. So it's not that um, officers have internalized any sort of norm of civilian control, but that they're loyal to an individual leader, political party, or part of the population. And countries that have not, uh, in which they don't have um, longstanding sort of traditions of civilian control, end up having to adopt all of these sort of subjective measures. And so some of the tactics that go under this kind of broader strategy of subjective control Control, um, address motives for intervention. They might involve um, efforts to bribe military officers, to artificially inflate salaries, or to give the military control over economic enterprises. This is an incredibly common tactic. Um, it's, you know, you can think of examples in which the military is very involved in the economy. Uh, Egypt is an example that comes to mind where uh, the military in Egypt has control over a whole number of economic enterprises. And this is a form of, a, you know, sort of subtle bribery to keep the military from intervening more overtly in politics. When I uh, presented my research um, uh, in Bangladesh and I ended up there speaking to several 
military officers that had been involved in coup attempts in Bangladesh in the past, they always told this was their favorite strategy uh, or tactic of coup prevention was to uh, was was this form of of uh, trying to sort of address potential motives uh, by offering uh, carrots rather than than sticks. So that's very very common. Another common uh, tactic here involves stacking the military with loyalists. So in ethnically divided states, this typically takes the form of ethnic stacking, trying to fill the military with people that aren't going to have a motive to overthrow the regime. So that's a, one sort of common fact. The other a group of tactics that fall under this broader category of subjective control try to restrict the ability the ability of officers and soldiers to intervene. And so some countries might limit access to arms, like you can only have weapons if you're, you know, there's some sort of rotation in which people have access to it, um, or they uh, they sort of artificially constrain the ability of um, uh, the, the military to have access to the weapons that the state owns. Um, that's, you know, that happens in some cases, it's not among the most common. The other tactic here that uh, we see a lot of is called counterbalancing. This is the strategy that I'm going to focus on today. So counterbalancing involves creating security forces that are independent from the military. So they report to the regime through some other chain of command. So typically, this is through an interior or home ministry. Sometimes a um, justice department or, or justice ministry, sometimes directly to the executive, him or herself, typically himself. Um, but they are not under the Defense Department and they're not under the control of the military. And these forces that we I refer to as counterweights, to be effective, they all they have to not only be independent from the military, but also have access to the centers of political power that end up being the targets for coup attempts. So during a coup attempt, um, which is a sort of illegal, overt effort to oust a sitting executive, uh, the usually what happens is military officers uh, leading the coup attempt to capture symbolic centers of political power. So a presidential palace, a legislature, uh, they usually also try and attack um, radio and television stations to be able to broadcast what they've done. And so counterbalancing, which involves creating these additional security forces, um, the way that it works is that uh, the regime creates additional security forces and deploys them with access to the centers of political power. So if a coup is underway, they might be able to uh, in, uh, interpose themselves in between the coup plotters and their targets or try and uh, retake targets that have been taken. So this is an incredibly common tactic of coup prevention. Counterbalancing is used around the globe. I, uh, as Max noted, I've collected data on how states organize and use their security forces. I collected this for about 110 countries from 1960 to 2010, and I'm currently extending that up to, to 2020. And uh, what I've shown you in this map is the highest number of uh, potential counterweights that a regime employs in any period or any time between 1960 and 2010. And so this is the kind of highest level of counterbalancing uh, that we see during this period. And you can see here, there's a lot of uh, geographic variation. Um, the darkest countries here are the ones that are, you know, the ones that are shaded in the most are the ones that have had the most counterweights. And so this scale ranges here from zero to five or more. And some of these countries, uh, you can see India here and um, uh, Russia, the former Soviet Union, uh, are among the darkest. Uh, these two countries have had uh, more than 13 forces. And so India has had 13, and I think 17 or 16 was the maximum uh, in Russia. And these uh, the kind of fragmentation of security forces here, security forces that are independent from the military and have access to centers of political power, was a deliberate effort in most cases to try and prevent a military coup. So in India, just to give you an example, um, uh, early post-independence leaders were very concerned about the prospect of a military coup. They watched what happened in Pakistan, uh, which had early and sort of then persistent military intervention, and they wanted to prevent that from happening uh, there as well. And so they started to build up internal security forces, which they call in their terminology paramilitary forces. Uh, the Central Reserve Police Force is a big one. There's a special protection group that does um, just protects the regime in power, and there's a whole series of other paramilitary forces that. Uh, the, the government in India has created. So this strategy or this tactic is very, very common around the globe. And it's become more common over time. So I tracked its use from 1960 up through 2010. 
You can see here that this is uh, the use of counterbalancing has increased. This graph shows the average number of counterweights that a country has, which goes from 1960, in 1960 about 0 0.8 to 1.3, a little over that in 2010. And the biggest periods of increase are the 1960s and early 1970s, where a kind of wave of coup attempts swept across many newly independent states. And then there's again a bit of an increase in the early 1990s, as you had a whole bunch of states um, uh, that the Soviet Union fall apart, and you had a couple other states democratize, and then you had regimes that were trying to protect uh, their uh, new institutions from uh, being overthrown uh, through a military coup. So it's be become incredibly common. The big question that my book tries to answer is just, does this work? Like, is it possible to prevent coups by counterbalancing the military with other security forces? And what I find is that counterbalancing increases the likelihood that coup attempts fail. So if you have a counterweight, if you've got a militarized police force or a um, militia, a Republican guard, a presidential guard, that's independent from the military and deployed typically in the capital where the centers of political power are, um, coup attempts that happen uh, in those circumstances are more likely to fail than uh, in, in places where they do not have counterweights. And the reason this is so is because counterbalancing uh, creates incentives for there to be some resistance to a coup attempt. The way this happens is as follows. So when a coup attempt starts, so there's very little like there's very little recruitment in advance of a coup typically because uh, this is a, a legal a coup attempt. Uh, and if the conspiracy is found out in advance, then the plotters are usually imprisoned um, or at least dismissed from their posts. And so there's very little recruitment in advance. And instead, most officers are faced with a decision once a coup is underway about what they're going to do. They haven't made a decision uh, in advance because they typically did not know that this attempt was going to occur. And so I argue that in deciding whether or not to resist a coup, to actually use force to try and prevent coup plotters from seizing power, officers take into account the likelihood the coup is going to succeed, the cost that they will incur if the coup fails, and how violence is going to be uh, if they try and use violence to stop the coup. So coups can be very costly, even for those who don't participate in them. The military as a whole can face a loss of resources, of prestige. There can be widespread purges that happen in the wake of a failed coup. Um, and there's, uh, if the coup succeeds and they haven't supported it, then they can also be purged. And there's, there's sort of individual level consequences that can happen. There's Cost to using violence during a coup attempt. Um, most of the dynamics of coups happen within, uh, typically within the army. This is the uh, the force that you know. There's some exceptions to that. There's some air force coups, that happen, um, and there's a couple examples of of cases where police forces have tried to stage a coup. But it's typically happening within within the army of a state. Um, and there's real concern about intramilitary violence and how this is going to divide the armed forces and um, is going to uh, undermine cohesion and have all sorts of sort of negative effects. So the way that counterbalancing works is by changing uh, people's estimation of these three different factors. When you've got a bunch of counterweights, it increases uncertainty about the outcome, right? Because you need to think then about, well, okay, how are the riot police going to this, can the presidential guard actually defend the regime? Uh, what is this other sort of interior troop going to do? Uh, and so that it becomes a much more complex calculation and it becomes much harder to estimate whether or not the, the coup is going to succeed or fail. For those officers um, that are in soldiers in counterbalancing forces, the ones that are in these kind of militarized police or Republican guards or militia, um, there can be real costs uh, to the coup failing or succeeding. And so if the coup is coming from within the army, uh, what often happens in the wake of successful coups is that the military ends up abolishing other security forces or bringing them under military control. And so police forces in particular often feel this sort of loss of autonomy. Um, they may lose resources and uh, or they may just entirely be disbanded if it's particularly if militia forces end up getting disbanded and, and other forces that are more personally tied to the regime. And so there may be some real concerns about those costs. When you have different security forces that are present, um, 
It also may lower perceptions about costs of violence because uh, there might be fewer sort of psychological barriers to using violence against a member of a different security force than a member of your own. That's not to say that there's going to be no cost that that, uh, that potential coup participants are perceiving, but that those costs might be lower. Right. And so all of this suggests that when you counterbalance the military, um, there's going to be there's increases the likelihood that the coup that any coup that is staged is going to face some resistance, and that increases the, the chances that the coup will fail. So I do in the book all sorts of like, you know, complicated statistical <laughs> work, uh, but I think that the basic story that I want to tell is actually pretty well conveyed, conveyed by just giving you this table. What this shows is that um, is the number of counterweights a country has, ranging here from zero to, I just stop at three, I do three or more. Um, and then the number of coup attempts that I see in this period, in this 110 countries uh, between 1960 and 2010, the first row shows the number of coup attempts, the number and the second shows the number that are successful, and the third just shows the success rate. And what you can see here is that when you don't have any counterweights, coups succeed and fail half the time, right? Half the time they're successful, half the time they fail. It's kind of a, you know, there's really 50-50 uh, here. Uh, when you have one or two counterweights, the rate of success uh, starts to decline. And when you have three or more counterweights, uh, the rate of success drops to 28% here. And so counterbalancing is associated with less successful coup attempts. I see that in this quantitative data and then in a bunch of case studies that I actually look at in, in the book in more detail. However, I think it's very important to note here that counterbalancing doesn't deter soldiers or officers from staging coup attempts. We still see coup attempts from uh, higher ranks within the military, and we still see them um, from uh, lower ranked officers and enlisted men. This table shows you um, the rate of coup attempts or the, per the percentage of years in which a coup attempt occurs across all countries in the data set. Uh, and I'm, here I've just broken it out by whether or not the country has at least one counterweight. So the, are they counterbalancing no or yes? Um, and what this suggests is that there's actually very little difference between the percentage of coup attempts that are occurring when you don't have counterweights and when you do have them. And so it doesn't seem to be associated with any reduction in the rate of coup attempts. Furthermore, uh, when you create a new counterweight, when you as a leader establish a new presidential guard that's independent, a new militia force, or a new uh, militarized police force, um, you, that is actually associated with an increase in the incidence of coup attempts. This is showing coup attempts in the year following the establishment of a counterweight. And so uh, in that a uh, year following the establishment of a new counterweight, the risk of a coup goes from 5% on average to 14%, which is a huge increase. So creating new counterweights risks actually provoking coup attempts. So in some respects, counterbalancing works it works to make it much harder for coup plotters to succeed, but it doesn't work in that it doesn't prevent people from trying. Right? And it can even actually provoke coup attempts that a uh, new coup attempts uh, to occur. So this is because while counterbalancing reduces the likelihood of, of success, it can also generate new grievances among military officers that provoke the very coups it was intended uh, to prevent. This is very common when you start reading accounts from coup plotters. Um, in a number of cases, some of them specifically mention uh, resentment that they feel or anger and frustration that they feel about uh, the creation of these new forces. This is uh, considered to be a pretty hostile strategy of coup prevention. Um, there are some incidents or, or, or some examples in which creating new counterweights doesn't uh, anger the military. Um, that's often when you're pumping just like vast sums of money into the security sector. So at the same time you're creating a new counterweight, you're also pumping a lot of money into the regular military to expand its ranks, to uh, upgrade its weaponry to there's all sorts of new defense acquisitions. If you're sort of flooding the defense sector with money, uh, you might be able to avoid this. Um, or if you're having your new counterweight take on uh, internal security tasks that the military doesn't want to do, uh, then you can also typically avoid this kind of um, provoking of a new coup attempt. But on average, uh, counterbalancing seems to create these grievances and be associated with this kind of uptick in coups. One example that I just wanted to show you um, or talk to you about was uh, this kind of one of the most 
well-known examples of counterbalancing failure. And this is um, during the 1966 coup in Ghana. And what you see in this case is you had a leader, Kwame Nkrumah, in Ghana, who was really attempting to build up a presidential guard unit called the President's Own Guard Regiment, which had been a kind of ceremonial force prior to uh, independence in Ghana. Um, he provided it with new resources, separated it formally from the military, they had a report directly to him, built their new residences. There's all sorts of uh, sort of perks that ended up going to this force and expanded them, uh, expanded their size. And this created a lot of resentment within uh, the regular military. And so a bun uh, the uh, interviews with coup plotters following the 1966 coup suggested this was a really driving force for the coup attempt. One of them said, uh, all of the emphasis this was on the this is the POGR, the president's own guard regiment, the presidential guard. Well, the rest of the forces suffered. So there's this real sense that they were getting the short end of the stick here, like that they were not um getting the same resources that the presidential guard unit was. A, another coup plotter said the following. And all of this plan to build a second army, uh, referring to the expansion of the presidential guard unit, uh, one thing stood out prominently, and that was a plan to gradually strangle the regular army to death. So this was really seen as a threat to the regular army. Uh, this was the building up of a competing force uh, that was going to be loyal to the president rather than to, uh, you know, the country as a whole. And there was a re real concern that the military itself was going to end up being, uh, the resources, it, it was being starved of resources that might end up actually being disbanded and just replaced with this kind of private force, right? So there's a real concern here about uh, the place, um, the status that is accorded to the military, and this provides Provoked, uh, that has ended up provoking the 1966 coup attempt. So one thing that I also show is an additional potential cost of counterbalancing is that it increases the risk that coups escalate to civil war. So this is because the way in which counterbalancing works is creating this sort of resistance from counterbalancing forces. Uh, and when you have resistance to a coup attempt, it can quickly spiral into a sort of broader conflict. Um, we tend to think about, uh, scholars of civil war tend to think about civil wars involving a higher level of violence than coup attempts normally do. Some scholars put the threshold for a civil war, kind of minimal threshold at 25 deaths, others put it at 1,000 deaths. Um, and what I've found looking at this data is that coup attempts that occur when you have counterweights are more likely to end up escalating to that level of violence that's over a thousand uh, deaths. This is still pretty rare. This isn't something that happens all that often, frankly, um, but it's more likely to occur uh, in cases in which there is counterbalancing. So, uh, I look in particular in the book at these cases of coup attempts in the Dominican Republic, one in 1962 and one in 1965. And in between these two coup attempts, there was a creation of a new counterweight, a new riot squad um, called the White Helmets that was actually trained by U.S. forces. Um, and uh, in the first coup attempt, it was bloodless. In the second coup attempt, uh, the riot police ended up resisting and the quickly sort of the situation quickly spiraled out of control uh, involving a whole bunch of civilians and political parties. And um, there was, uh, you know, several thousand fatalities within the first couple of weeks. And then there was a U.S. intervention, which ended up ending the conflict before it went any further. Uh, but so that's a case in which the counterweight played a really pivotal role in kind of expanding this from a kind of intra a dispute between like, within the regime, between the military and civilian leaders, to something that had the potential to, to be much broader. I also find that counterweights can help uh, escalate coups to civil war in another way, and that's that they can provide a sort of ready-made ready rebel army for rulers that have been ousted by a coup to try and challenge a coup-installed regime. And so the case I look at here is the coup attempt in Yemen in 1962, which escalated into a civil war that lasted several years and ended up dividing the country into North and South Yemen. Um, and in this case, the coup attempt succeeded. Uh, they ousted this new imam who had come to power only it was like a little over a week before the coup attempt. Um, but he escaped and he was able to use these um, tribal forces that had been serving as counterweights, as along with parts of his presidential guard that had escaped with him, uh, to basically serve as a rebel army to try and come back and then challenge the coup-appointed regime or coup-installed regime. And so normally we think about insurgencies as involving huge organizational challenges uh, where you have to 
you know, potential rebels have to recruit and train and get money to equip and house uh, insurgents that are going to then challenge the regime. But in the case of a civil war escalating from a coup attempt, uh, you can actually have as parts of the um, security forces break off, um, and they often break along these lines where it's the sort of counterbalancing forces that 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 might break off. And so they can counterbalancing can provide this sort of ready made army that you can use to then challenge the coup installed regime. And so these are two kind of paths through which counterbalancing can make coup attempts escalate. So I find that uh, on the whole, it's associated with more failed coups, but doesn't deter coup attempts and can increase the risk of civil war. Uh, so in short, uh, I think we can say in some respects counterbalancing works, but it's a very risky strategy for regimes to pursue. Um, there's a lot of costs that come with it. Uh, it can provoke coup attempts, coup attempts that do happen can escalate. Uh, there's a bunch of other costs that other scholars have identified that I mentioned at the outset, such as that it can impede military effectiveness uh, because it's hard for like different forces to work together in the battlefield if they have not been training together. Um, and it also, uh, there's other work that suggests that it can increase, um, the in create incentives for uh, domestic repression. So there's a lot of risks or costs involved in this strategy. Uh, and I think taken together, it suggests that it's one that might weaken regimes in the long run. This is not a strategy that uh, fosters objective control, uh, civilian control of the military, and does not foster professionalism. It, it can help perpetuate and further entrench political involvement from military and security forces. And so in that way, it's a sort of temporary uh, way of addressing uh, the risks of military intervention in politics. And it's not a strategy that uh, I would recommend for those that are concerned about trying to prevent coups abroad. All right. Thank you very much. Um, that was a great overview of your research and the argument in, in your book. Um, I am going to take the, the moderator's privilege to ask the first question and potentially a follow-up, but I do want to invite all the any other guests in the room to please ask any questions at all that come to mind. Uh, I'm not sure how many of the cadets in the room read the monkey cage regularly, but or... Um, I, I know that uh, they, they probably have been seeing a lot of the uh, news about um, the president's, um, all the kind of turmoil with the personnel turnover at the, um, at the Pentagon. Um, and you had a really uh, powerful and persuasive, um, persuasive argument uh, kind of pushing back on a lot of journalists that were calling this a coup. And you said, no, this isn't a coup. Um, and importantly, why that distinction? The election's been, results have been dragged out for a little bit. And also because there have been some sort of high level staffing changes that have been happening at the Pentagon that people are concerned about and not really sure what's happening. Um, the administration has not yet officially conceded the election, and there's um, many Republican elites that have been uh, supportive of this position, sort of insisting that we we don't we don't yet know the outcome. And so uh, I saw several journalists start to to suggest that actually we've moved from like worry about a coup to a situation in which a coup is actually occurring right before our eyes, and. As someone who studies coups, I took some offense at this, um, in part because we have a pretty well, a commonly like understood definition of a coup uh, in political science among people who who study these um, uh, these internationally, and that's uh, coups are illegal overt attempts to unseat a sitting executive, and 
they occur with, uh, they're backed by force or the threat of force. So many of them are bloodless. They don't necessarily involve any violence. Actually, the ideal coup, I think, from many coup plotters' perspective, doesn't include any, any violence whatsoever, but it has to include the threat of it. And so there's several things about the current situation in the United States that don't fit this, right? So nothing that's happened thus far, as far as anyone can tell, is illegal. Uh, there's where, you know, the the president has the ability to make staffing changes. Um, he, so this is not something that he's doing sort of outside of the parameters of, of his authority. Um, he is in charge until uh, the inauguration of a new president. And so he's not overstayed his term or, uh, at, any, at any point. Um, and I think that none of the stuff steps that uh, the current administration or Democratic challengers have, have been taken involve the threat of force, right? This is something that, uh, this is the reason why uh, I, I often use coups and military coups interchangeably, and that's because uh, civilian elites can start coups, but they can't actually carry out the threat of them unless they've got the backing of typically the regular military. There are some rare cases where other security forces can be used, but you would actually need to have the military involved. And there seemed to be absolutely no evidence whatsoever um, that that is the case right now. It seemed incredibly implausible to me. And I don't think that anybody that studies civil military relations in the United States is like actually concerned about this being the case. Um, and so I tried to write this piece sort of explaining uh, what we think a coup is and that it has to involve this threat of force and that what's happening in the United States does not fit that, uh, doesn't fit those criteria and is incredibly unlikely to. And the reason why I thought this was important to try and clarify for people right now is that the way in which um, you stop a coup, uh, like we have a set of strategies that we know of for how, how you can stop coups. Uh, those are different than how you would stop an attempt of a sitting executive to try and overstay his time in office. Um, and in particular, right now, all of the action that's happening, the things that when journalists are saying they're scared of a coup, what they're talking about is like statements by typically Republican elites about, uh, you know, in support of being like, well, we know we, there might be fraudulent ballots or we need to recount or things like that. And that the, if that's what they're concerned about, then like the pressure then would need to be on civilian elites. And talking about a coup, in, to my mind, really distracts from that sort of pressure. Like if that's what you, if the, if the, that's the problem, <laughs> that it's a civilian solution. It's not, like you don't need to speak to anyone, any you don't have to convince military officers not to get involved. Like they're not the, the issue. And so to me, it just felt like the, we need to understand the difference between a coup and whatever concerns people currently have, because those are not, you wouldn't address those, you would address those in very different ways. So that was the thought. Makes a lot of sense to me. So. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I got a lot of pushback on it. So <laughs> I got a lot of people who are yelling at me about how I don't see that there's a coup happening. And I, uh, I feel like I <laughs> need to just continue to put my foot down that like this is it seems incredibly implausible to me that there would be a coup backed by military force in the United States. This seems really outside the realm of, of the possible from from my observer's perspective. So, Well, I know a lot of people that very much appreciated your uh, your clear application of the definition and the policy implications of the difference too, in terms of of how to affect change. Um, I'll, I'll ask one more question in the American context. Erica, could you say a little bit about how to, um, um, you know, I know that you you ha you did find evidence of counterbalancing forces in the United States, mm -hmm. and uh, which I think might be a new concept to a lot of people. So could you give a couple examples of what some of those forces are and maybe how they compare to uh, the counterbalancing forces in authoritarian countries? Oh, great question. The US is always such an interesting and tricky case, I think. So what I would say is that I, I think there are security forces in the United States context that have the potential to serve as counterweights. Uh, for the most part, they were not created with that intention. Um, and that's because for a long time after this country's founding, right, we didn't have a standing army. Uh, and we had a very decentralized um, and fragmented a system of military and police power. And that has really persisted over time. And so, you know, you have police forces at the local level, you have uh, 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 every state has the ability to call the National Guard. You have got uh, a whole series of federal police forces. Um, I was just looking through a sort of centralized list of these before this talk, because everyone does, I always get asked about the US. And <laughs> it just, 
the number of <laughs> federal police forces, local police forces, is like uncountable, in my opinion, in the United States. And we're really an outlier internationally in that. Like most other countries, their policing systems are and their, their security forces are a little bit more centralized. So there'll be like one national police force rather than police forces at every at every local level. When I think about how to classify forces as potential counterweights or not, I'm thinking specifically about forces that are organized at the federal level so that the president um, himself or herself could direct those forces. I'm excluding all of the kind of fragmented, like, you know, the like National Guard in like Oregon has nothing to do. Uh, is, is that something uh, that I'm counting here or local police forces in Milwaukee where I'm from? Like, those are ones I would exclude. And then the forces have to be independent from the military. So I would uh, exclude anything else under the Defense Department. Um, and I would think about excluding also forces that have these kind of really specialized uh, roles. Like, you know, we have police in, that deal with fisheries. We have highway police. We have all sorts of different things. They really like they have access to weapons, but they're not, um, you know, they're not concentrated around centers of political power. And they are not like what if there were in the realm in which we'd be talking about like the U.S. military, like the army in particular, trying to seize control of the capital, like they're not in a position to do anything about that. And so I think the closest that we have in the U.S. case are the Secret Service, uh, the Marshal Service, and uh, potentially the FBI. None of these are equipped on par with the U.S. military, right? These are not forces that um, would be, uh, we would think about as having that same kind of coercive power. Uh, but they do have uh, access to arms and they do have access to centers of political power. And if were there, we in some sort of unthinkable situation in which military power had been politicized to such an extent that there was an attempt at a coup, those are forces that could potentially be brought to bear. So I think about the U.S. case as one in which, like, you started the sort of historical development of military and police power in the United States was purposefully fragmented in order to make it harder for any one uh, force to become very powerful or powerful enough that it would exert undue influence over politics. Uh, and so you ended up in a situation where there's a bunch of different forces, but I don't think that they're specifically what's preventing a coup attempt from happening right, in the United States. Like, I think it's plausible that they uh, were someone to attempt a coup, that the, oh, there's a whole series of forces that could kind of come in to come into that. But in general, we are kind of in that objective strategy from Huntington, right, of like having this kind of division of responsibility and this, uh, this recognition among both civilian and military elites that there is a sort of division of responsibility and that uh, the military is supposed to be under civilian control. Like that's something that seems to have widespread acceptance um, such that that seems to me to be primarily what's preventing coups rather than this kind of like worry that somehow like the Secret Service is going to like <laughs> prevent, <laughs> prevent you from staging a coup. And so I think that it looks like counterbalancing in some ways, but that's it's not the sort of central driver of civil military relations in, in the U.S. context. Great. Thanks. That was super thorough. I can tell that you've gotten that question. Before. <laughs> um, Niara, do you have a I'm sure you have a more creative question than the one I gave. So that was actually one of the questions that I was wondering myself. But my other question was. Um, so you mentioned that what's going on in, in the U.S. right now is not a coup because the policy actions are very different. So I was wondering, what um, are the difference between the policy actions that you think would be taken here if the situation were to escalate and the policy actions taken um, in the case of the coup? Oh, that's a good question. So this is a situation in which if we're to sort of spin out the worst fears that I'm seeing journalists propose and some sort of some political leaders but the Trump administration will find some way to try and stay in power. And what this comes closer to is what scholars think of as uh, are have called self coups or auto golpes from the Spanish, because this is the examples of this tend to be um, have said it to be in Latin America. Um, and the idea here is that there's some democratically elected executive who comes to power through legal means and who primarily uses legal means to try 
remain in power past whatever initial term limits were in place or overthrows the results of some sort of election that uh, was legitimate. And typically that's through pressures on the court system. Sometimes there's public referendums that can happen where uh, a president will say like, well, we had this election, but it was beset by fraud. So let's have another election. And then somehow magically the results of that election have been massaged such that uh, there's some sort of mandate for this executive to stay in power. And so those are, I think that situation is like slightly more plausible, <laughs> right? Um, where there's these legal challenges that you see the administration making right now um, to uh, counting of absentee ballots and counting of military ballots that are coming in. I mean, this is kind of, it's, very, it's like, it's very weird to be thinking about a, a situation of a, anything resembling a coup when you're antagonizing the military by not counting uh, ballots uh, that it's casting, um, its members are casting, but that's, they're sort of trying to, there's some efforts to be mounting some legal challenges, but you need to have um, a judiciary that's gonna go along with that. And I think thus far, we haven't seen evidence of that. Some of the lawsuits have already sort of fallen apart. And we just had, like, the election just went very smoothly, right? Like, we had international elections observers that said that. We had workers at every place that are Republican and Democratic. There's not concerns about widespread fraud. And so I think that some of these kind of maneuvers um, aren't really going to work. And I think that there's a lot of discussion now you see coming out of the uh, administration where it it seems clear that many of the people within the administration understand that are like admitting that there's going to be a sort of, that there's going to be a transition. And so I don't like, I guess I've just become to a much more optimistic place <laughs> about where we're at. And I think that the closest that the, what could be attempted in this circumstance is this kind of self-coup situation. But all of the historical examples of those, like I'm not an expert on those in particular, but there's cases in Peru and Guatemala and Russia that uh, that people point to. All of those also require this kind of backing of the military. Like they also require the threat of force. And people have been very concerned in recent decades that the military in the United States is becoming more politicized, that civilian elites in particular are always trying to pull in, you know, get to say that they've got the backing of all these retired generals or that, you know, they like they they like to because the military is popular. And so they they want to like benefit from that. And so there's been that kind of concern. But I just do not think we're at the place where you would have um, top military officials being willing to back these kind of irregular, like, ch like legal challenges, like you still have to have that. And I just don't see that we're, we're there. So I think there's like a coup possibility, a self coup or auto golpe <laughs> possibility. And then there's just this kind of like, like shenanigans, like legal shenanigans that are it's not, that's not succeeding. And so I think that it's, yeah, I mean, I think that like, I think that their risks are are pretty low. And I think if anything, what is what has been, I think, concerning to me as civilian elites that have been willing to indulge kind of this discussion of like, well, we don't know, was this a fair election? Like, I don't know if these ballots should count. And that's concerning because I think all the from like we don't have any evidence that there was widespread fraud. And so to have political elites publicly challenging that and publicly questioning that can undermine people's trust in these institutions and could have a kind of a long-term corrosive effect. And so that concerns me, but I still don't think we're going to be at that point of like it becoming even a, a, what we call a self-coup. I didn't realize I'd be like the optimist in <laughs> that, that, that that would be my role in this last week, but <laughs> I've come around there. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the question. Who's next? Bing, go for it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, first, uh, thank you so much, uh, ma'am, uh, for taking your time to come here and speak to us. Uh, this is a really interesting topic. Um, and I'm cadet three. Um, I'm also an international cadet from Cambodia. So this topic is really interest and really interests me. And I want to bring it a little bit uh, outside the United States. Um, I have a question of like when when I, when I think of a successful coup. I think I know I often associate it with a totalitarian military control regime. Uh, I want to ask, is there any historical evidence of a successful coup turned into like a democratic uh, state? Uh, this Thank is you, an excellent question. Thank you. This has been a big debate among scholars uh, in the last couple of years about whether or not coups can be a force for good, like a force for democratization. 
Some people have come to argue that they coups might be the only way actually to get entrenched dictators out of power. Um, and I think there are some historical cases of that. But what I've seen in the research about this is that on the whole countries that uh, authoritarian regimes that have coups don't tend to democratize. They end to they tend to five years, 10 years down the line, end up being in the sort of same place that they were prior to the coup attempt. So there are people, not me, but other people who uh, study to try to quantify, you know, the extent of democracy that you have in a case. There's all sorts of indicators of how we measure democracy that uh, gets, uh, that there's a lot of different ways of kind of measuring what's a democracy and how democratic and, and, and not a country is. But no matter which of these kind of measures you use, you, you very rarely see real changes after a coup attempt. The most common outcome is that a coups and dictatorship results in more dictatorships. What you have seen uh, in the last two decades is that um, there tend to be following coup attempts more pressure for elections. Uh, the, this is because the international community, in some respects, has come to think that this is we we have, we shun coups now in a way that we did not during the Cold War. Um, so there's more kind of international condemnation, and there's often international organizations that will get involved and try and push for elections to be held. And so what you have now often is a coup attempt that will displace an authoritarian regime, and the interim government that will come to power will say, okay, we're going to have elections in six months or something. Uh, and so you do see an increase in instance of elections following coup attempts often, uh, but they don't tend to result, they're not typically not free and fair elections, and they don't usually result in any sort of lasting changes. And so on the whole, it, um, uh, this is something that I've uh, I've spent, a, I've spent a lot of time thinking about, um, and I've really come to feel that there's while in some respects you may need the military to remove its support from a dictatorship in order for that dictatorship to fall, if the military is the one doing the ousting, the military is the one uh, taking over and, and then governing, that doesn't bode well for the sort of uh, next regime. And so I think on the whole, it's not a very potent tool for democratization. Um, but I think that military officers have a real role to play in the context of ongoing protests. If there's a movement against the authoritarian regime, the military can play the role of saying, OK, we're not going to repress this movement. Like that's a movement. That's a kind of political involvement that is, I mean, it is political involvement in some ways. It is less than ideal, but it's also not the military stepping in as directly to say that we're going to actually remove this person from office or we're going to take charge ourselves. And so the military can play that kind of role. And I think that's potentially more constructive role in these contexts. But it makes me very nervous to think about allowing or encouraging military intervention as the sort of way to get to democratization. Because I think once you have that, once you take on that role, it's really hard to give that up, right? Like we see a lot of countries in which you just have like just military keep doing that. This has been the case in Turkey, for example, for a long time, where like, you know, these are coups for democracy in some respects, uh, but like they, they somehow the military never really leaves. Um, so yeah, so I think they're, they're not as, I'm not as optimistic about that as a, as a potential positive role. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thanks for the question. Hello, ma'am. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, bringing it back to the United States, um, you know, I was wondering outside of our current moment um, in time and looking ahead to the future, um, when you have kind of U.S. senators saying that democracy isn't the objective of our system um, and kind of, you know, this contingent of, I would say, the United States populace that um, seems to kind of like this kind of populist rhetoric and kind of populist leaders. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the long term health of United States democracy. Huh. Well, thank you for that question, which is a is a big one. Um, I think I think those types of statements are very concerning and very corrosive. Um, we have, in some respects, I think American democracy is not as old as we think it is. In that, it's really only been the last couple of decades that there has been widespread ability to vote and to fully participate in political life. Um, and so that, in some respects, I'm, I can think of American democracy as, as I'm hopeful about it because I think it's actually younger than, <laughs> uh, than, than we think it is. And so for a country that hasn't had, uh, you know, widespread political participation for that long, we're doing a very good job. Um, 
I think it's really dangerous when political parties start to feel like the only way in which they can remain in power is by subverting or you know restricting access to voting or kind of using sort of legal maneuvering or gerrymandering or redistricting things like this to try and um corral the vote in a way that uh, enables them like that's the only way that they the path towards uh, remaining in power and it's in those moments that you see people really start to say like oh well we're we're not a democracy we're a republic or like we're you know it's actually about minority rule is very important you know, the rights of uh, minority parties are very are very important and that kind of rhetoric then allows you to have capture by um parties and political ideologies that are more extreme um so you I think the most healthy functioning democracies tend to have um, more political parties than the United States has. Uh, they tend to have more center right and center left parties in addition to far right and far left parties. And that allows for these sort of uh, broader governing coalitions and for things that to feel so high. In a situation in which, in a country in which you only have two political parties and political institutions that are really rewarding, it's like kind of a winner take all system. It, you can end up having um, parties start to embrace their more fringe elements uh, that are not committed to the sort of free and fair competition. And so, really influential for me this year has been this book. Um, oh, I think I have it. I think I have it right here. Uh, it's called How Democracies Die. I have a copy of this book, but not yet my own book, which is uh, <laughs> supposed to arrive later this week. Um, but this book um, is by Steve Levitsky and Daniel uh, Ziblatt, and they are scholars who've studied, um, one of them studies Latin American politics, the other one has studied, to, has studied um, uh, right-leaning parties um, in a whole bunch of circumstances. And they really find that what when democracies erode or die, as they call they call it in their more, more dramatic terms um, than, than I would use probably, uh, it's because you have this sort of situation where um, one party, it's typically the more right wing party, ends up uh, uh, coming to feel like it can't win through the sort of normal electoral process and starts embracing more far right extremist ideologies. And so I do have, I think we're in a very concerning moment, um, but I think that we are having kind of more widespread awareness that our political institutions right now are not very well matched with how polarized the society is. And there have been real movements for reform, things like, uh, you know, reworking, uh, you know, letting new states in the union or vote, passing kind of comprehensive voting rights acts that would allow. It's becoming a situation in which uh, Republican elites can make the choice to try and appeal to a broader range of the electorate, or they can make the choice to try and go down a path of actually preventing people from voting or trying to, you know, jury rig things. Um, it's only been in, uh, since about uh, the year 2000 that our institutions have come to be such that the Republican Party has. Uh, in two elections in my lifetime, like lost the popular vote, but then won, <laughs> won the presidency. And that's a situation that that's not longstanding, like that's very new. And so to me, that suggests that there can be that people are aware of kind of those that there uh, is real pressure to try and address these issues and head them off. And partly in writing this piece for the Washington Post about like the way to focus on civilian elites, like this is part of my thought was <laughs> that uh, really the problem in this situation are civilian elites who are trying to figure out how to remain in power and the incentives in front of them are such that like they're concerned that they're not able to do that within the, the normal sort of bounds of our political institutions. And so what I think, you know, I think we're all human and like we all, you know, Republicans and Democrats alike would like to win elections. And so you have to try and structure incentives for people so that they all, they align for like everyone remaining within this kind of political competition in our institutions. And I think that the way to do that is there's some reforms to be undertaken that I think would allow, uh, would sort of, would head off the temptation to be sort of veering off into more anti-democratic, um, anti-democratic things. So I'd recommend How Democracies Die. <laughs> if you haven't read it already, it's a good sort of um, a book about this comparatively. And I would just say like, 
we just, you know, I think there's enough people that have really been mobilized in the, in the last couple of years uh, around this that I think that there's um, there's going to be real pushes for institutional reform in the next couple of years. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm, ho I'm, I'm hopeful that um, that that we're not sort of veering too far off course yet. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the question. I'm just going to go ahead and, and echo that. How Democracies Die is a fantastic book, uh, and you all read a book review of it for 307 uh, or 357, so uh, I'd encourage the full read. Uh, Amir, go ahead. Man, thank you so much for coming in, a, well, virtually and speaking to us about this topic. Um, so in our American politics class, we talk a lot about uh, the institutional norms that prevent the coups in America, um, like the objective control. Um, and so in terms of um, efficacy in preventing coups, is it um, institutions like counterweights um, or institutional norms like um, objective control that uh, play a more like a stronger part? And in, in terms of nation building, um, where when we're focusing on preventing coups, um, where should we kind of layer focus in, in developing norms or those institutions? Oh, that's a great question. So I would say that norms are more effective, but we don't know how to build them elsewhere. Like they're very hard to export norms, um, where it's whereas we know how to help a country build their own national guard, right? Like we know how to help them build up militarized police units. We've been doing that for a really long time, and so um, I think ideally uh, we would be focusing on trying to create institutions that will help protect uh, like the uh, the ability of a political system to hold elections and have an alternation of power long enough that you can have those kind of norms develop. But I think it takes a really long time. And so it's not a sort of short term solution for Iraq or Afghanistan, for example. Right now, countries that have been beset by coups for for decades and that we have spent we've poured an immense amount of resources into trying to, to, to help them build political institutions and build up um, uh, the security forces as well. And I can see the reasons why leaders in those countries have uh, the temptation to try and, to try and counterbalance. This is something that uh, is a sort of short term way to address the problem. Um, and you can understand why individual leaders are really tempted to do it, right? That the cost for a coup for an individual leader is really, really high. Whereas the sort of downsides of counterbalancing for them might be more amorphous. Like, so they're kind of undermanning their ability to fight ISIS. Like, that's a problem. Uh, but it's maybe less immediate of, of a problem than being thrown out of office, right? Um, and so the percentage of leaders following coups who get killed is very, very high. So just on a personal level, they have that kind of incentive. So they're going to keep trying to do it, I think. Um, and in the sort of short term, I think that there are tactics that the um, international actors could take, including the United States, uh, where, you know, if there were strong vocal condemnations of coup attempts and a like immediate, you know, cutting off of aid, um, those types of tactics, those types of pressure could uh, be an effective coup deterrent. Right now, I think that there's been a temptation under, you know, all of the previous administrations that I have studied, the Obama administration, the, uh, the uh, Bush administration before that, the Clinton administration, to not to condemn coups, um, particularly where they're overthrowing leaders that we that we think are maybe not aligned with American interests. And so you get into a situation where there is some sort of the United States has a lot of like diplomatic power and they have like coercive power economically. Like we have a lot of tools other than uh, j just, um, uh, you know, the trying to, I mean, we have a lot of tools to, <laughs> to influence um, the sort of incentives that facing actors in other, in other places. And so those, I think those things could be used more effectively to try and dissuade potential coup plotters. Um, we, you know, as I'm sure you're aware, like we have, there's a lot of efforts the United States um, puts into training foreign militaries. And some of that training does include training on norms of democratic and civilian control, right? There's those modules that they get about that. Um, but some of that does not seem to be particularly effective um, yet. So I think we don't have, we haven't kind of cracked how to export norms of civilian control. The best we can do is try to uh, strongly publicly repeatedly condemn uh, military intervention in politics in other countries and that that can, um, I think, over time help foster that those kind of norms. So that's, I think, the best we've got right now, which is not great, um, but it's not, it's also not, not nothing. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thanks for the question. 
So uh, I do have a copy of your book, and I finished it uh, yesterday. And kind of the second to last page, uh, actually, Amir and your conversation just kind of trickled it. Um, so I want to throw this out there as kind of the transition to uh, the military side. So you talk about policy uh, recommendations uh, right at the end of your conclusion. You discuss uh the amount of money the U.S. spends on developing norms uh, to include bringing officers uh, here to the U.S. to study uh, and try and export that as well. Um, from my experience uh, in Afghanistan, one of the things that uh, I found interesting and, and I was reflecting on as I read the book was that uh, the tension between the Afghan National Police and the Afghan National Army uh, was something that I didn't really understand at the time uh, as a young officer. But now, in hindsight, uh, it's clear that a lot of the mechanisms you discuss in the book from uh, stacking groups ethnically uh, and trying to build uh, solidarity that way, uh, competition between army and resources is prevalent. So um, what what recommendations would you make to officers who are going to be in this position, uh, not as the policymakers making policy and trying to learn how to exp export norms, but for those individuals who are actually going to be on the ground trying to deal with these issues of counterbalancing forces, um, what could you offer to, to these future officers? Oh, well, you're, we're ending here with a tough question. Huh. I mean, I guess the, the main thing I would say is, or that I would hope will come out of the work I was trying to do in this book and in our conversation today is an understanding of what incentives, the like difficult situation that leaders in uh, other countries, countries that haven't internalized these sort of norms of dem democratic and civilian control are in. The difficulties faced by police officers, by military officers um, in these contexts, uh, like they're, they can, we can, it's easy to look, I think, from here to say that this is, you know, this is, we can blame individual leaders, we can blame individual police officers for and military officers for the sort of tensions between their forces or not cooperating effectively or trying to, you know, getting engaged in these like budget fights or, um, you know, it's very easy to blame um, leaders for ethnically stacking their forces or trying to turn them into their sort of personal armies. But I think that the risk of a coup is very real um, in a lot of places and it, and it feels very, very immediate. And the sort of, when you're in a situation of, in which you're dealing with active insurgency or you're in a situation in which there's very few resources to go around, um, these are also incredibly, like incredible, incredibly important fights at the sort of individual level for the members of all of these different uh, organizations. And so I guess, just having some sort of understanding of, of the difficult constraints that they are under and to not sort of vilify people for the choices they're making and what are admittedly very, very bad circumstances. Like, it's very easy for me to say like, well, you should just, you know, internalize this norm of civilian control and why would you challenge, you know, don't challenge civilian leaders of your country. Um, but like, that's not something that might not be the most appropriate response in, in, in that sort of context. And so I think that what I, when I started to write this book back in 2014, I was in a situation uh, where ISIS was, uh, this was where they were taking over large tracts of uh, northern Iraq. Uh, things were looking really grim and there was real blame being placed on Iraqi leaders. And I think that some of that was, much of that was warranted. They, there was, you know, there could have been making better decisions in some, in some respects. But I saw this sort of tendency among American policymakers, at least, to kind of be like, to be suggesting like, well, if we just had better, you know, they have, we had better quality leaders or something in this country. And like, are they just, you know, they don't know, they don't understand what they're doing too. They're destroying the effectiveness of their own military. And, and, and I think they do understand. Like, I think that they are making choices in a sort of different context. And so I think just going in with an understanding that the threat of a coup really remains present in a lot of other contexts and that affects everybody's behavior in ways that might be not optimal from, from, from the, from the outside. And so I'm hoping that if anything, this book is just sort of shedding light on the sort of difficult situation that, uh, that we're in and to, and giving, and hopefully just giving us a sense of what possibly the, the limits of our own ability to sort of affect change on the ground. I mean, I guess that's not a very <laughs> inspiring uh, message to be left with, but I think that this is really, this is a tough problem. 
on like how to prevent coups and how to keep the military out of politics in a situation where civilian elites are really trying to pull it in all the time is not something that is very easy for any outside actors, no matter how involved we are in helping them restructure their security forces and rebuild their institutions. Like that's not something that we have power over. And in some ways it just takes time. Like it takes, it's going to take decades of having peaceful trans, uh, you know, transitions of power. And like, that's, it's, we don't, we don't have the power to like create that. Um, so yeah, so I guess it's just leaving with this sense of um, like the lack of uh, agency we might have in this situation and understanding of the sort of constraints other people are, are under. That's the only thing I would say. Um, I wish I had like a better, I feel like this book is in some ways unsatisfying, which I wish I wish I could come up with like a list of like, well, here are the five things to do to just prevent coups and we can, uh, we can do it. But I think I mainly am concluding that it's really hard to do and there's some benefits to this approach of counterbalancing and some real costs. And at least maybe we can go in with our eyes open to what those benefits and costs might be. Thank you so much. Um, Max, I'll turn back over to you. I think that's a really great way to wrap it up. Um, so I know we're, we're basically out of time. Um, I would like to give you a big round of applause, but I don't know if that's going to sound good uh, here. But uh, thank you so much for, for coming out virtually, especially uh, so late on a weeknight. And yeah, I, I'm looking forward to Know, future engagements between you and West Point and MWI, and hopefully we can get you out here in person sometime. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. This was such a treat to get to talk to all of you. And I, yes, I hope at some point we can, uh, this pandemic become, <laughs> comes to a place where we could do something in person. It would be really nice to, really nice to do that in the years to, uh, years ahead if possible. Um, in the meantime, thank you so much for inviting me to, uh, do this. I, I really, uh, really had a wonderful time and really appreciated all of your thoughtful questions. Thank you. From all of the folks here at the Modern War Institute, we would like to thank you for watching our videos and invite you to explore our podcasts and our webpage linked below.